Jesus. Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today. We believe today's message is going to strengthen and encourage you. So get your Bibles ready as Pastor Jeremy File is teaching today's message. Jesus is coming. He is. Now some of God's own children don't really believe that anymore. They believe the voice of the mockers over the voice of the Spirit of God. Don't be caught with that trap in that trap. <laughs> Don't be caught with that trap hanging on your leg. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just stumbled upon a video about a guy hunting coyotes and he was trapping them and stuff and he caught a few of them by the leg. Then he did away with them because they were into farmers' cattle and some other stuff and so they were being pest. And I, I just thought that's a little picture of Christians in the end time hour. You listen to too many different voices and the voice of a mocker is going to get you trapped and stuck you're going to get stuck, and you don't want to get stuck. Instead, we should be excited. We should be like the little kids in the back seat of the car. Are we there yet? <laughs> We're there. Praise God. Matthew chapter 8. Say it one more time. Thank God for the Word. It's good to see you tonight, Wednesday night at Accelerate Church, a remnant end time church. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. I'm going to attempt to move quick tonight. When Jesus had come to the other side... To the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce. Now take note of this. That word fierce is only used one other time in the Bible, and it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says, But know this in the latter times, the last days, perilous days shall come to pass. It was written to Christians, written to a pastor in particular, that perilous times, which is exceedingly fierce, basically defines for us here, a demonic warfare. Here we are. This is the most exciting time to be alive in human history. I believe that. Somebody said, well, I, I wish I was alive when Jesus was here. Well, you're not. You're alive now. So you might as well get excited about that. Right? <laughs> you get one shot at life. So whenever you're alive, thank God he even gave you life. But here he put you in the last seconds of the last minutes, of the last hours of the last days, and that's not hype. That's a very accurate description of where we are on God's calendar. And you're going to face days that are exceedingly fierce, perilous, difficult to get along in days. Why? Demons are after you. Thank God, God is for you. Angels are assigned to you. And they're stronger than those that have fallen from their state. And all the demonic spirits that try to attack your life. But that doesn't mean you're not in warfare. And I can tell by the look on some of your face, I'm looking at the camera when I say this, you're in some serious warfare. I want to tell you tonight, don't give up. These demon-possessed men, they had a problem, a big problem with a lot of devils. You see, they were running around naked in a graveyard. The people that do that mess nowadays, they're demon-possessed, just like these guys were. Now, they go and put them in padded cells if they do that now. And there's a lot of demon-possessed people in padded cells. Not every person in a padded cell is demon-possessed, but there's a lot that are demon-possessed in those cells. Now, these guys were exceedingly fierce. I just wanted you to take a note of that because... We're in this exceedingly fierce warfare in the days we're in. You got that? That's where we are. But we're well able. I said we're well able to navigate these end times and to stay excited, even in warfare. Look at your neighbor and smile real big and say, I'm excited. <laughs> Look at this. No one could pass this way. Because these demon-possessed men in Matthew 8, verse 28, no one could pass this way, but Jesus did. You see, Jesus is the way maker. It's more than a contemporary worship song we sing. He's the way maker, and he can make a way where there seems to be no way. So Jesus was the way maker. Matthew 8, verse 29, 
And suddenly they cried out. These were demons speaking through these men. And the demons said, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now underline that. Before the time, you've got demons inside these crazy dudes that understood Jesus had a schedule and that he was a bit early for his schedule. What? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew it was before their time of torment, but they knew there was a time of their torment that was yet to come. Now, it's a dirty shame to be a follower of Jesus and not care about his timetable. It's a dirty shame for demon-possessed men to have demons crying out and say, have you come before the time? What was on their mind? A day that's yet to come. And yet, children of God seem to be like, well, it all pan out. It don't matter. So let me get this straight. Demons are more concerned about what time it is than a child of God. That's a dirty shame. If someone important was going to come pick you up, they're coming to get you, you should stay alert and keep looking. I've told the story about when I was a youngster, I was a teenager, and I moved to Amarillo from Wheeler, so this is big city life for me, because when your town has a population of 1393, we counted every one of them, you know, and you move here to a town of almost 200,000, you're like, this is big city life. And... So I moved to the big city, to a bigger church, and I got involved with the youth group. And the youth pastor of a youth group that had about 250 people attending the youth group said, I want to take you to dinner. Well, I was excited about this. So you've heard me tell the story. I won't go into all the details, but I'll just say I lived with my parents. I'm 18 years old, approximately, maybe 17 still at that time. And I'm waiting at the door, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm watching, and I'm looking, and time is ticking. And we don't have cell phones back then. Well, only the rich did. I didn't have any cell phone for myself back then. But I had a landline, 806-355-6799, that I gave to anyone that wanted it. Thought I was in high cotton. See, I said it memorized because you never know when somebody might ask you for your personal number. But this is like, I mean, a phone now. It wasn't a rotary, but it had digital numbers you had to push if you're going to call somebody. So it would ring, uh, Hello? Hated it because me and my sister had to split that line. And so I hated it when it was her friends wanting to talk to her. Hurry up. I'm expecting to call. So I go and I look. I think maybe I need to call. I, I call the, the number to his office. No answer. Hmm. I go back to the door and I watch. I look. He drove a black Toyota Celica. Look at these details I remember. I'm 44 years old. Why did I know this? I'm looking. I knew what he drove, and I'm looking to the end of the street to see, do I see headlights? Yeah. See, here's what happens. Christians are like this and live this way, and other Christians are like, oh, that ain't doing you no good. Well, it's going to cause you to live in a more circumspect way if you're looking and you say, is he coming, is he coming, is he coming, is he coming? You're not hiding under a rock. I <laughs> heard Joe Morris, an end-time preacher, say this. We're at the end. And he said it again today. It's time to accelerate to that ribbon at the end. He said, I've never seen a runner run and say, what is that? The finish line? Weird. Odd. Nobody does that. We press. We go with all we've got. Because the time is at hand. Hey, greater. I said greater. Greater. Is he that's in me. One of the greatest, I believe, battles and fights for the everyday Christian is to shake off this world because all it does is make you dull. Makes me dull.
everything on this planet, even some of the good things, it's all meant. Talk about marriage, talk about kids, talk about jobs, talk about money. It's all meant to bring you out of the spirit realm and rub the world in your face. You got to do this. You're responsible for that. You got to figure this out. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What is it that God told you and me to get out of our life, cut off that friendship with that pagan, that heathen, that hell-bound sinner, cut this thing, this habit, this thing out of your life, and you got rid of everything but your one You better get circumspect about following God's call in your life, because He's coming. And don't lose track of God's timepiece, Israel. You know, God's not doing anything different. He, he's a God of patterns. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days when the Son of Man returns. There was a timepiece in the days of Noah. You want to know what it was? It's more specifically who it was. Methuselah. Which means, when he dies, it shall come. If you... Or like me, I like making charts and putting the years out. I've done this before on a piece of notepad, put it out there. Methuselah was born. Enoch was his dad. Enoch walked with God and pleased God and was translated he shouldn't see death. Enoch was not here to see the flood. His son, he named him when he dies it shall come, which means he knew at least 969 years ahead of time the flood was coming. Because he walked with God. And when you walk with God, you know what's happening. You know, it's, well, you know what time it is. So you know something others don't know in an entire generation. And you're supposed to be like Enoch because we're living a perverted generation much like he did. And so there was a timepiece, Methuselah. We've got a timepiece. It's Israel. So, you know, if you were back then, and every time he walks around, names meant something, then he says, when I die, it shall come. You want to do whatever you can to keep that boy alive. Unless you're a mocker and you don't believe. Now, here Israel exists, and I showed you Sunday they won't be removed, and they believe that. You may not believe it, but they believe it. And more than anything, God said it, and he watches over his word to perform it. So I don't care what leader from what nation and what terrorist group says they're going to wipe them off the map. It ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you, they're the apple of God's eye. You poke your finger in somebody's eye really one time. You're going to get a reaction. You do it a couple of times, a couple of decades, you're liable to lose a hand, if not your life. So people better watch what they're doing. Now, I want to say this. If you don't know what time it is on God's calendar, you won't know what you ought to do. And I just explained American Christianity to you in a nutshell. If you study American Christianity, you look at Barna's polls. He's a Christian, by the way. And you look at all these polls that are happening. We have a minority that attend church that have a biblical worldview on things. We have a minority of pastors in this country that have a biblical worldview on things. They don't think biblical. They just think humanistically. But thinking humanistically will lead you to hell. you got to know that. So you got to get off that track and think biblically. So if you don't know what time it is biblically, according to God's calendar, you're going to be like a goose in a snowstorm, not knowing what way is left, right, straight. You don't know. You're lost. Now there's a group in the Bible recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, I want to look at. It says here of the sons of Issachar. It tells us this. This, is, this scripture literally has marked my soul. I'm telling you it has because the Bible has this in there. Recorded for a reason. The sons of Issachar had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. See, when you understand the time and the times of God and how he's working, then you know what you ought to do. But if you don't know what time it is, you don't know what to do. A simple and plain example. If you didn't know that it's Wednesday and then we have church at 7 p.m., then you don't show up. You know, now it's different to know that and then just not come. That's a different thing I'm not preaching about, but that's a different thing, and you shouldn't do that. But it's one thing to not know. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. Well, no wonder you don't show up. You see what I'm talking about? You don't even know what you ought to do. I, I don't know if you've been like me, but I've slept so good some nights, even here recently, 
I wake up, I'm like, what day is it? What day is it? I got to look at my, oh, okay. That way I know what I ought to do. Because what if I wake up and it's Sunday and I feel like sleeping? I'm a pastor. I'm a man. I breathe. I put pants on too. I was going to say two legs at a time. Only firemen do that. One leg at a time. Right? Are you listening to me? Somebody said, oh, you're human? Absolutely. But I'm not just human. I've got the greater one in me, just like you. Praise God. So what if I feel like sleeping? Well, I'm going to get up anyway. You know, and every one of you that have talked to me, I know every time it's kind of become something that y'all look for me to say, some people do. Hey, I'll see you at church. Just waiting for me to say it. I'll be there. I will. And you're not shocked. Now, if I'm not here, you know this. I'm going to be in church more that week than you. <laughs> I'm going to go get full. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Right? Let me see. Why are you talking about that? Because I'm trying to get you to see we're there. Where? On God's timetable. We're in the waning moments of this church age. The sons of Iskra had an understanding of the times. They knew what Israel ought to do. And I want you to know it matters to Jesus whether you recognize the times or not. Why do I say that? Well, because of Luke 19. I want to show you this. Say it one more time. Thank God for the word. I see time's going to force me to land this thing soon, so I guess I will. But Luke 19, for now, let's look at the Word. Verse 41, aren't you thankful? These times in our life, we ought to be so thankful for when the Word of God's just coming forth and we're receiving. Now, as he drew near, this is Jesus. He saw the city that's talking about Jerusalem. Now you go study and see if what I'm telling you is true. It is true. But Jesus drew near to Jerusalem. And look at this. He wept over it. The only other recollection I have of Jesus weeping is when Lazarus died. And when I was a kid, my favorite verse to memorize was that. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. I got that one down. It's one of the shortest in the Bible. Jesus wept. When he weeps, you ought to pay attention. Now, he wept over the city Jerusalem. Why would he do that? Well, verse 42 of Luke 19, he said this, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Whoa, there's a big clue of something. Verse 43, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you surround you and close you in on every side, verse 44, and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So get this. The sons of Issachar are commended by saying they knew what they ought to do and what Israel ought to do. So they're looked at in a positive light because they knew the times. They understood the times. But Jesus wept over a city that didn't know the time of their visitation. They're oblivious to it. Here's the king. Here's the Messiah. And they didn't know. They had no idea. Did you know this has happened to thousands, if not millions, of people? You'll sit in a service like this and the Holy Spirit will deal with something specifically you're dealing with in your life. I may not even know the details, and I don't need to know, unless it's a testimony later on to the goodness of God. But I'll just say this. When the Holy Spirit deals with you on something, pay close attention. Because if you ignore His conviction, if you ignore His warning, the only choice for you is to walk blind in that area. On the second and fourth Sunday nights of every month, we have Life Links. We gather together with like-minded believers and discuss the current series that Pastor Jeremy is preaching. We have food, we laugh together, we pray together, and we build those godly relationships with our brothers and sisters within the church. We would love for you to join us for Life Links. You can find a list of all of our groups along with their locations on our app, our website, or just stop by the desk in the lobby. We have someone there ready to help you find the perfect LifeLink group.
Now see, the entrance of God's word brings light. He brings light so you know what you ought to do, so you're not stumbling around in the dark. But to know the light and turn off the light and then stumble on something and blame God is absurd. God's not your problem. You're your problem. Israel should have known their time of visitation. You know why? Daniel prophesied about it. Before Jesus was here, and we read those scriptures out of Daniel 9. Remember, Israel's 70 weeks. Let me clarify that for just a minute because there was a couple of comments that have been made to me about not understanding this. Those are prophetic weeks. If you're taking notes, write that down. Study this out later. Those are prophetic weeks. Every week that is prophesied by Daniel of those 70, in each week is seven years. I can show you from Scripture. I've done it before in previous series. I'm not doing that tonight, plus we're low on time. But I'm just here to tell you, when you see 70 weeks, that equals 490 years. Now, I find it very interesting that on this verse, I was looking in my Dake Bible, and he notated something in his notes that just jumped off the page at me. He said they didn't know their time of visitation, though they should have, Because Jesus was crucified, or to use Daniel 9's terminology, cut off exactly 483 years after the commandment at the end of the Babylonian captivity to restore Jerusalem and the temple. Exactly what Daniel said in chapter 9, verse 25. We read it already in this series. So I want you to catch this. Jesus was crucified exactly 483 years. Now, you don't have to be a mathematician. But since each week represents seven years, if you take seven and multiply that by 69 weeks that have already happened, and then he says Messiah will be cut off, you have exactly 483 years. But there are seven more years prophesied for Israel. And I want you to think back in this series because, well, I took you through Romans 11 so that you would understand something. God's not done with Israel. But the only way they can be saved now is to receive Jesus as Messiah. Their temple sacrifices aren't going to save them. And none of them, as sweet as they are, are going to be saved. Or as mean as they are. Some of them are mean. But I've come across several sweet Jewish people. But the fact of this, sweet people, just like I said earlier, good old boys don't make it to heaven. Sweet people don't make it to heaven. Saved people with faith in the blood of Jesus make it to heaven. Why in the blood of Jesus? Because he was the sacrifice for our sins. And the eyes of Israel is going to be open. Now, they're blind right now. That's why Jesus was crying here. That's why he was weeping. Wow. Here's the point. People that understood the times are commended in the Bible. People that didn't know the time were wept over. So where's our time? Where does that put us? Well, we've got to be about our Father's business. You see, the rapture of the church should produce comfort. And I want you to know there's a blessing attached to living the lifestyle of looking, a constant, consistent looking for Jesus to come back. Why do I say that? Titus 2, let's look at it. Are you okay tonight? Titus 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The what? The grace of God. Keep reading here, verse 12, Titus 2. It teaches us. To deny ungodliness, I refer to this a lot, but it's good to lay your eyes on it. So grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness. It's not just a cover for ungodly way of living. See, that's what people think. Well, I'll just live however I want, and God's so gracious. That's not grace. Grace that brings salvation teaches you to say no to worldly lust. Grace teaches you to live sober. Well, that's got several meanings. But I'll tell you, intoxicant frees one of them. To live righteously and godly when we all get to heaven. Well, you're going to live godly. You're going to live righteous. You're going to live sober when you get to heaven. But you got to start doing that right here in this present age. But grace also does this. Here's the effect of grace. Teaches you to look. (laughs) Looking for is an active state of mind to be in. And when you really intersected grace, you're going to live a lifestyle of looking for the blessed hope. What is that? The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So grace, 
And the more of it you walk in produces a higher expectation to see the appearance of Jesus. So the less grace, God's divine influence on your heart and His reflection in your life that you walk in, the less you look for it. The more grace you walk in, the higher your expectation to see Him. The less grace you walk in, hmm, He can come, I don't really care. You see, it's not crazy to look for Jesus to return. It's called living in grace. <laughs> You're crazy living that way. I, I'll talk to you in a few years and we'll revisit this. I'm still going to be walking and swimming in the grace of God, thankfully, looking for him to return. Somebody said, do you believe us this year? It could be. But I believe that year after year after day after day after month, it could be this day. What if he came before I lay my head down tonight? This is a blessing to have this hope. Now people say, well, I don't believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. Well, there goes, you ever heard air go out of a balloon? Just that annoying sound. Hopefully that was a good example of it. I might listen back to that later and cringe myself. Cringe. Hashtag cringe. These young people and their words. I said bussing today. My daughter said, you can't say bussing over that. I said, who's the bus police? I say bussing if I want to say bussing. The rapture's bussing. You can't talk like that. Yes, I can. Who sets the standard on bussing? Young people are like, we do. No, you don't. Let me ask you a question. Speaking of knowing terms and knowing everything. Do you think John the Revelator, who penned the book of Revelation, would happen to know whether we're going to be here during the tribulation or not? You think he would know? I think he would know. He would know, wouldn't he? Well, he wrote another book, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, let's look at what he said. I just want to, I want to leave this with you tonight. I know we got to go, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just kind of stirred up about the word. I'm, I'm enjoying this more than some nachos over at our favorite restaurant that's on sale tonight. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved. Now your ears should perk up every time you see that because you know if he says beloved or brethren, it's written to who? You and me. Now we're the sons of God. See, when you receive Jesus, you're the sons of God. If you're in the beloved, you are a son, a daughter of the Most High God. Praise God. See, you got to believe that. I can tell by the silence of most people that they're still struggling with that. No, you're called to be a son or a daughter of God. Well, I will be when I die. No, you are right now. Well, that does conclude today's television broadcast. But if you would like to hear more from Pastor Jeremy File, we invite you to head over to our website at acceleratechurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find every sermon that Pastor Jeremy has preached for your convenience. If you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We are located at 4400 South Crockett here in Amarillo, and our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you're not from Amarillo, we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at info at acceleratechurch.cc or give us a call. We want to know how can we pray for you? Where are you watching and tuning in from? We are so glad that you tuned in with us today.